providing I get through, and I think I'll be through in about 30 minutes. So, <clears throat> uh, those of you that are in the Wednesday lab section leave about uh, four or five pages since uh, the Monday and Tuesday pa uh, sections have already had, had uh, finished up the flower cluster uh, development and thinning and so forth. How many pages? <laughs> Eight pages, okay. Okay, what are, what are the different types of growth regulators that are used in agriculture? And I've listed them here on the board. And this is a general outline that I'll be following in my lecture. And there's four, five general types of uh, growth regulators or hormones that are used. Uh, the auxins, and the uh, second is the gibberellins, third the cytokinins, fourth the retardants, and fifth a relatively new compound, an ethophon, or it's an ethylene releasing compound. Now under the auxins there's a whole slew of compounds. Uh, 4-CPA is the most common one. This is a 4-chlorophenoxy acetic acid. You don't have to remember that. And there's uh, many others. IBA, IAA, NAA, and BOA. There's a whole bunch of these that uh, have been used in agriculture. However, none of these auxins are presently used in grapes. They're, there was at one time, 4-CPA uh, was used for a while, but it's been pretty well replaced by, gib by uh, gibberellin now. And in the gibberellins, there's a, another large class of compounds, and they usually number these GA1 up to uh, about GA20 something. So uh, there, there's many different uh, types of uh, gibberellins then also. Under the uh, cytokinins, there's one natural compound that the chemists have isolated zeatin is the natural cytokinin present in plants. And there's several artificial cytokinins also present. Uh, a couple of these are, well, one of these is B9, uh, no, sorry, uh, BA, benzoadenine, is, is the most common synthetic cytokinin that's been used. <coughs> uh, the retardants, again, there's several retardants that uh, have been used. Uh, the natural retardant, or in usually it's often called an inhibitor, is this uh, abscisic acid. And that's generally associated with senescence, uh, with the dormancy of the buds and with the senescence of leaves going into the uh, winter. It's also, I mentioned, I think, uh, earlier, that it also regulates the closing and opening of the stomatas, abscisic acid, uh, abbreviated often as ABA. A couple artificial retardants that have been used are B9, and uh, this is a, con you don't have to remember this, but it's succinic acid, 2,2-dimethyl hydrazide. Uh, this is, B9 is, is also called SADH sometimes, or ALAR sometimes. And a, uh, a second artificial retardant that has been used is this compound CCC, uh, capital CCC, and it is uh, the chemical name of that is 2-chloroethyl trimethyl ammonium chloride. Again, you don't need to remember those chemical names. And then uh, we have last uh, this new group of compounds, the uh, ethylene, and it's uh, been associated with a, as a berry ripening hormone. I might say that these first two uh, groups of compounds are generally have the function of cell elongation and, and cell division is their main main effect. Uh, the cytokinins uh, have a role in in, uh, in grapevines at least, in a, in a role in bud break and fruit set. They seem to be involved in bud break and fruit set, and they are principally synthesized in the roots. Although there's some indication now that there is some synthesis in the above ground parts of the vine, they are principally uh, uh, manufactured or synthesized in the roots, the cytokinins. And the retardants, I mentioned this abscisic acid, it has this role in, in senescence and uh, opening, closing of stomatas. Okay, let's uh, talk for a few minutes about the increasing fruit set. And the first compound that was used was this 4-CPA compound, 4-chlorophenoxyacetic acid, and it was used to increase fruit set in black corneth vines in the 50s. 
but it uh, soon gave way to, uh, uh, to gibberellin. And the reason it did this was that it often caused hard, hard seed coats to develop. And of course, uh, zanny corn or black corn is used mainly in the baking trade, and this was a very undesirable feature to have these hard seed coats developed. It also caused excessively excessive set. The, the clusters were so tight that you often got bunch rot. So for, for these uh, two reasons, it was given up. Now th this compound, I should also mention, it can completely substitute for girdling. Girdling uh, has the effect of increasing set also. And, and 4-CPA can, can completely uh, take, the, uh, take the effect of, uh, over the effect of, uh, of girdling. Uh, in the other two classes, I think I mentioned that girdling has the effect of retarding the movement of, uh, of uh, co organic compounds, including the sugars and, the, and, uh, and amino acids and the hormones from the top of the vine to the, to the roots. And by keeping these compounds in the above ground parts of the vine, this is increases the size and the set of, of these roots. <coughs> so gibberellin has now replaced the 4-CPA as a, as a girdling substitute in black corneth. And this is applied at concentrations of about uh, two to a half to five parts per million at the stage of, of bloom to three days after bloom. Two and a half to five parts per million GA at bloom to three days after bloom. And it mainly increases size. It'll approximately double the size of uh, the black coronaviruses and it has little effect on set. Now, GA has been reported to increase uh, setting in varieties in the eastern varieties, the, the Labrusco or Concord types. There's been a couple reports where uh, GA will actually increase set, but it has usually no effect on set in the vinifera varieties, at least the ones growing in California under California conditions. Now, uh, a, th a third compound that has been used to increase uh, set is this uh, retardant CCC or, or inhibitor or retardant CCC, 2-chloroethyl trimethyl ammonium chloride. And it's a, to increase set, it's usually applied one to three weeks before bloom. And the literature indicates that it can increase set by about 20% if, a, if it's applied about one to three weeks before bloom. The mechanism there is that it retards the elongation of the shoot and it diverts the carbohydrates from going into the shoot tip into, to, to going into the uh, cluster in, a new, in a better nutrition of the ovaries. So it reduces the shoot tip as a sink and diverts more of the carbohydrates going into the, into the flowers and into the nutrition of the ovaries. This has not been used in California to any extent of, in fact, it's not registered to use in California. It, is re it has been used in some other countries, in Europe and Australia, and I think it's been even used in New York to some extent. Okay, now I'm going to uh, go on and discuss the, <coughs> the effects of hormones on, or the uses of hormones on increasing in size of seedless grapes. And first I'll talk about black corneth. And as I already mentioned, that uh, GA is used to, has substituted for the CPA in increasing the size of black corneth. And the concentrations there uses two and a half to five parts per million, applied at 30 to 90 percent bloom, or usually referred to in the industry as capfall. Capfall and bloom are used uh, synonymously. And this produces a relatively loose cluster of a suitable size fruit. It, it actually doubles about the size of the berry and it actually causes some reduction in fruit set. But the increased size of berries more than compensates for the reduction in set. Now care must be, extreme care must be used in using the right concentration of this. If, uh, if too large of a concentration is used you get uh, too big of berries and this is in the undesirable for the bakery trade. And I might also say that almost all the commercial black corneth vineyards are now, they now use uh, gibberellin rather than girdle, since they can get the same effect with gibberellin as they do with, with girdling. Now, 
Now, and now let's talk about the effects of, uh, on, on Thompson Seelis of uh, gibberellin increasing size. And in the uh, use here now is a double application of, of uh, GA. The first application is applied during the 20 to 80 percent cap fall or 20 to 80 percent bloom. And the levels used are two and a half to 15 parts per million. This causes the elongation of the rachis or the cluster, and it in, that's one effect. It increases the size of the berry, particularly the elongation of the berry. This early, this early application of, of gibberellin makes a berry very much elongated. This is 20 to 80 percent bloom. And it, it thins the cluster in, in either in, in a, this process, in, during this application, you do have some thinning of the cluster, some reduction in set. You have an elongation of, of the rachis, <coughs> and you have an increase in size of the berries. Then a second application of gibberellin is used at berry shatter or set. This is usually a 10 to 14 day later application. And the levels here used are 20 to 40 parts per million. Though this, appli this application mainly affects the radial growth of the berry. And it has by far the largest effect on berry size, the second application. What was the concentration? 20 to 40 parts per million GA. What was the concentration? Uh, two and a half to 15 parts per million. So the second application has mainly an effect on berry size, increasing the diameter growth, the radial growth of these berries. And if you're only going to put on one application and you wanted to mainly increase size, you would skip the first one and use the second one. The second one has the largest effect on, on berry size. Now the reason they went to double applications here is that the first application, you, uh, sorry, before they were only using this one application at the at the sh berry shatter stage. And they did have no effect on reducing set during this application. And by the large increase in size, they produced such a tight cluster, they found that this was causing a lot of bunch rot in these table fruits. So by going to this double application, they first loosened that cluster and expand the length of the, of the rachis. And uh, they don't have this very tight, compact cluster. Now, the, the table grape growers also do one further step. They go through, after they've made this double application of GA, at the same time they make this second application, they go through and girdle the vines. Some of them do, at least. And by these three operations, this early, op uh, early application of GA, the second application of GA at shatter, and the girdling, they can usually triple the size, or you're even more than triple the size of these berries. So they end up with a big, uh, Nice looking bag of water, what I, I call a bag of water. It's, it's a pretty tasteless grape as far as I'm concerned. And, but the consumer ha usually buys grape by what they look like and uh, that this is what the consumers have bought and this is what the growers produce because they, they sell the best. But in my, in my way of thinking, if any of you have had a chance to taste the ungirdled, unjibbed berry and taste that and compare the taste and the flavor of that now with one of these GA treated ones, I, I don't... I think uh, you lose a lot in flavor, but uh, nevertheless, this, this is the way the industry has gone. Uh, I can show a couple pieces of data here illustrating this effect. First, on, first uh, with black corneth. The con this, this is with black corneth now. Concentration of uh, GA, berry weight. Zero, five, and 20. The, berry, this, the size of these berries was 0.26 grams at maturity. The maturity here was, uh, oh, let me get this in that effect. Maturity here is 23.4. By applying five parts per million GA, they increased the size to 
and the maturity was still essentially the same. By going to 20 parts per million GA, they increased the size to 7, 8 grams per berry and reduced maturity somewhat. But this was the recommended level to use. Uh, if you went to this level, the berry got too large for the, and the bakery tray didn't want it anymore. And you also were reducing maturity. Now with, uh, for, for uh, Thompson Sealess now, This is Thompson Sealess. And here we had control. 20, 20 parts per million GA at bloom. And 40, 40 parts per million GA at fruit set. And then the, the combination of the two, 20 parts per million bloom plus uh, 40 parts per million at the set. And berry size, weight per berry. Or this is actually weight per berry was uh, 1.5 grams here per berry, 3.28, 4.02, and 4.75 here. This is grams per berry. The number of berries per, number of berries, number of berries per centimeter of lateral This is per centimeter of lateral length of the cluster. This, this would be an indicator now of the looseness of the cluster. This, this was, there was about five berries per centimeter under the control. This reduced it down to about 3.5 berries per, per centimeter. This, there was, this had little effect, as I mentioned, had on looseness. There was about 4.9 berries per centimeter, and, and this had 3.1 berries per centimeter. So it's this application here that's loosening the cluster mainly. The bloom, the bloom time application. Uh, maturity was affected here some, to some extent. Uh, let's see. I don't have the data for that one. It wasn't given, but 19.6, 15.2, and 17.3 were the degree Brex maturity on those. Okay, then uh, that pretty well covers the effect on the increase in size of seedless grapes. I should mention that the that gibberellin is not used on on seeded table grape varieties because it generally causes shot production of shot berries, and this is a very undesirable featuring for table fruit. So on seeded berries, gibberellin is not used in t for table grapes, generally. I think we might show those two, first two slides there now, to give you an idea of what. This is, shows you, the, this was, is before black corneth now, and this shows you the effect of uh, GA on increasing the size of black corneth. You see, uh, this is the control, very small berries, and I don't know if you, can you see that effect? I guess you, I guess you can see that. This was with uh, an application of uh, 10 parts per million GA, and it more than uh, tripled the value, uh, the size of these black, or zani corneth fruit. Yeah. Is 
Well, th this was actually, he, this is really just illustrating the effect. Now, this is larger than they usually want to want to get. They they actually apply a concentration of about two and a half, two and a half to five parts per million GA now, and I think. Let me just check that note. Yeah, they used 20 parts per million GA here, so they got a, a too large of an effect. But anyway, it shows you what GA can do to the size of this Zanny corn or black corn berry. This is only applied to the cluster? This was sprayed on the whole vine. The whole vine? Yeah. The next, uh, they, try to, they try to direct the spray onto the cluster, though. But they, they don't go to the trouble of, of uh, dipping individual clusters. It is sprayed on the vine in the region where the clusters are located. Would it be better if it was sprayed on the cluster? It would be, yeah. Yeah, I think it would be. But uh, you can't, it would be too much labor going around and dipping clusters. Now this shows you the effect of uh, gibberellin on Thompson Seedless. It's not the best slide in the world, but it's the only one I could get from Weaver. And uh, this is the control where there was, uh, th these clusters were very cluster thin. You reduced it down to four, la four five laterals, but there was no gibberellin put on these fruit. Now this was uh, sprayed with gibberellin at the shatter stage. And you see a very tight cluster. You increased the size of these berries quite a bit, but you didn't reduce or thin, thin out the berries any. Now here's where they put on this double application. They put on GA at, the, uh, at, at bloom one application at bloom, I think it was uh, 10 parts per million at GA at bloom time, and then another 40 parts per million at berry shatter. And here you've loosened the cluster and, and increased the size somewhat more than you have here, quite a bit more than here. Okay, that's all for the slides for a minute. Okay, let's then discuss the, the effect of uh, GA on uh, thinning clusters with GA. And as I've already mentioned, uh, on table fruit and Thompson seedless table, we put on this bloom time application of two and a half to five, 15 parts per million. On raisins, it's sometimes also used to thin out the berries a little bit. And here they use a one application, uh, five parts per million in a GA at 20 to 80% bloom. And this is uh, used to increase the maturity of the fruit to some extent. You thin out the berries somewhat, and this will result in a little higher maturity. Although it's, it, this, this use of GA for raisin production is not widely used by the uh, growers. And then probably the one that many of you are interested here in, because it deals with wine varieties, is thinning is used to reduce the compactness of these tight clustered wine varieties. And here the vines are sprayed when the shoots are about 15 to 20 inches long, or when the clusters average about three to four inches in length. And this is generally when, uh, this is generally two to three weeks before bloom. In other words, if you were gonna spray the wine varieties for loosening of the clusters, these tight clustered varieties, you would have done it about a week ago, about two to three weeks before bloom. And the shoots are 15 to 20 inches long, and the cluster length is 3 to 4 inches. Now, the concentration to use depends on the variety. Uh, for Tina Madeira and Palomino, they recommend, uh, I'm not going to write that on margin, uh, Tina Madeira and Palomino, you recommend 1 to 2.5 parts per million GA. For uh, Carignan and Valapinas, What's in Alico, Ali, Ali Alico, uh, two and a half to five parts per million. And then for the three varieties, which actually is principally used on, Zinfandel, which is one of the most tight, tightest clustered varieties, and Petit Syrah and, and Chenin Blanc, they recommend five to ten parts per million. Now this cluster loosening results from three things. It's, there's an elongation of the rachis again, elongation of the cluster. There's a, uh, some production of shot berries, but this is not really undesirable for wine production. And there is some reduction in set also. 
Now this application uh, of the GA, pre-bloom application of GA for cluster loosening is generally considered a form of insurance because there, this is a problem in, in some years more than others and you never can predict beforehand what this problem will be. And it's surprisingly that it hasn't been used more in the grape industry. I understand there's only used, been used, uh, there are only a, the amounts that are used are about two to three, two to four thousand acres have been sprayed annually for, for this uh, cluster loosening effect. And it seem, would seem to me that this could be used much more extensively in the industry than it is used. Since you do not lose production, it, you lose, have very little effect on production. The, you do reduce set, but the reduced set is more than compensated for by a slight increase in berry size and a, and a lower loss from bunch rot. Question? Any effect on maturity? Uh, the effect of maturity is, 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 is minimal. Yeah. What kind of a dilution effect does it have on the berry? Well, the, the effect now is mainly is mainly in reducing set and elongating the cluster. There's a slight increase in size. So you you mean the ratio of skin to uh, pulp? Now you're thinking about? Well, you mentioned that with some Well, now you now get this point straight. You get a big response to GA on seedless varieties because uh, uh, seedless varieties are low in, in, in hormones. The seeds themselves are a source or a stimulus for hormone production. On seeded varieties, you'll never get a response more than 10% an increase in berry, berry size. It's usually somewhere between 2 to 10%, but it's a small increase. But if you're going to get a crop versus losing the whole crop from bunch rot, it's, it's going to be, and if you're in an area where you know you get this bunch rot every year, it seems like to me like it would be a, a, a worthwhile uh, cultural practice to use. Have you ever tried on collette? GA has been used on perlette. The timing there is, 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 is more important than on Thompson seedless. And it does respond, on, and perlette does respond. It's a seedless variety. Oh, for thinning? Yeah. But again, uh, Mr. Casamatis uh, published some work done, and he found that the timing in that was really cru crucial, on, on mo even more so than on Thompson Seedless. So I want to stress this point once more, though, that on seedless varieties, you, you can the vines are evidently very tolerant of GA. You can, they've even sprayed up, on to, up to 500 parts per million without any detrimental carryover effect on the vine. On seeded varieties, however, concentrations exceeding 10 parts per million generally have a carryover effect the following year and you can have reduced bud break or, bud f or many buds fail. So there's a big difference there between the seeded and the seedless varieties and their tolerance to this GA. This might be one of the reasons why growers are reluctant to, to maybe use this GA because they're scared that they're going to affect their bud break the following year. But uh, it does work if you, if you use the right concentrations. Now again, and I've already told this to the Monday and Tuesday lab sections, that the, the pollination, the, the act of pollen tube growth, the act of uh, fertilization and the, and the seed growth are all sources or stimulus for hormone production. And in seedless varieties, of course, you don't have a seed, so you you lack this source of hormones or oxygen gibberellin production. And evidently, there's enough of these compounds already present in the uh, seeded varieties, while these uh, hormones are deficient in the seedless varieties. Okay, there's one other thing that I can just. Uh, this is this effect of, uh, of uh, enhancing fruit coloration and ripening by ethophon. This is still more or less experimental, but uh, I'm sure this is going to be used in the in next year or two. It's gonna, there's going to be registration. I talked to several of the farm advisors in a meeting we had a few months ago, and they said that ethophon will be registered for use on emperor by next year. And this compound, is, 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 it says there, in, has an effect of increasing the coloration and, and the maturation of the fruit. And it, but the timing is crucial here also. 
Now, if you apply uh, a berry, a berry goes through this double sigmoid growth curve, and to get an effect of ethophon on increasing coloration, if this is if, if this if this is time down here, and berry size here, it goes through this. Uh, This is the growth curve now. This is about where Verasion starts at about the second. This is phase two of growth, and this is phase one of growth here, and this is this lag phase here. And you must put on your ethophon at the end of this lag phase or the beginning of the second growth phase when color change first begins to get an, to get an enhancement of color. So uh, apply your ethophon at the end of the lag phase or the beginning of the second growth phase when about 10% of the berries show the first indications of color. The concentrations that are being suggested for use are somewhere between 200 and 500 parts per million. And the Australians report that you can increase the time of maturity by three to seven days and you can more than double the color or at least double the color or the amount of anthocyanine pigments in some great varieties. It looks like the first uh, variety that, or the one it will be principally used on, this is from, a quote from some farm advisors, will be Emperor. Uh, Emperor is, is a variety that responds very favorably to ethophon, and they want a, and want a good colored table variety. Yeah. Yeah, and it will be used on tokays. Tokay is another variety in which often there is a deficiency in color, and it's very sensitive to high temperatures. If you have high temperatures, you usually don't get very good color, and this, this compound probably could be used to increase color of tokays. There is a couple of detrimental effects now that probably should also be mentioned. That I have been told, and this, is not, this has not been published or anything, but they've been told it also causes some softening of the berry, and it may have some shipping problems. It may also have some loosening of the, where the pedicel attaches to the berry, too. Some loosening effect uh, of the pedicel where it attaches to the berry. Yeah. Is this related to seeded versus seeded too? No, I don't think it matters. No, but this, this ethophon now is being commercially used in tomatoes, for example. It's, it, this has been registered for use already there, for a lot of acres or sprayed with ethophon, and it, it, uh, it causes these tomatoes to be more uniform in their ripening. In other words, they can go through and harvest the whole thing at one time, and there'll be more of these tomatoes will be ripe. Uh, this is one application. It's been used for ripening bananas for a long time. It's used for degreening citrus fruit. Uh, so it's there won't be any problem getting it registered because that it's a natural compound that occurs in, in plants anyway. Well, eth I think I did mention that earlier. Ethophon, of course, slowly releases ethylene gas. Ethophon is a, is a uh, I don't know if the chemical name here, I have it. Uh, anyway, it's ethylene gas that, uh, that releases eth ethophon. Uh, the, the chemical name of ethophon is 2-chloroethylphosphonic acid, for those of you who want to know that. And the, the, uh, one of the effects of ethophon, though, and this, this was, is it shortens this lag period, too. Physiologically, it, it reduces the length of the lag, or this, uh, re this lag phase of berry growth. Okay, I think uh, that covers what I want to cover. If there's, are there any questions, uh, ask them now, and then I'll, if not, I'll let Cook take over. Uh, the softening of the berry and, and, and the uh, abscission. It, it, uh, many of the caps or the pedicels where it's attached to the berry uh, are not attached very well, and, and, they, and they break off there. Pardon me now. What's the source of all the gibberellas? Well, it's a, it's a uh, natural compound in, in, in plants, too. Now, the source, I, I don't know if it's been very well... I, I think at least the precursors of, tartaric, of uh, 
of a gibberellin are synthesized in the in the lees. And maybe the gibberellin itself is not synthesized, but at least the precursors of the gibberellin are synthesized in the leaves, and maybe the actual synthesis takes place in the fruit. I, I don't know. But this is not very well understood yet. Uh, I think you're referring to the commercial Oh, well, fu uh, fu uh, the fungus, uh, fu is it, what, what fungus is it that makes, uh, makes gibberellin? What fungus makes gibberellin? Fusarium or? Fusarium, yeah. So this is the way it's made commercially. Question back there? Uh, well, you can, if you apply it anywhere from the middle of the lag phase on, it'll, it'll work. If you, apply, if you apply it before that lag phase, then it actually retards berry growth. Okay. Uh, show you the cluster loosening effect on Zinfandel. This, this cluster over here was uh, the cluster over here on the uh, left is, is a control. This had one parts per million GA, 10, and 100. This was too loose now. This would have been the ideal amount of, uh, of GA to apply to get this loosening effect on, the, on this tight clustered Zinfandel variety. So it is a seeded variety, you know. So 100 parts per million is too much on the seeded variety, right? Remember this whole matter of uh, hormones and thinning and so forth is extremely confusing. The best thing you can do is what I told one of the afternoon classes this week, is that whatever works on a seedless variety does not work on a seeded variety, and vice versa. For well, whatever we're talking about. That's a good general rule that if it works, except for this ethophon, which we don't really have all the dope on yet, what works on a seedless variety is the reverse on a CD variety. Um, I've got three or four blue books up here, Fine, Claiborne, Senton, Perez, and Warsham, all who turned them in to, uh, for one reason or another to have them checked over. Some of you uh, did not make it to the Monday discussion wanted to see about turning your blue books or questioning them. If you've got problems on your blue books, then put them in my mailbox in the office and with your note and I'll discuss them. But from about 15 years experience, I know if you come in with one question worth two points, you'll spend a half an hour. And we're not going to worry about a half an hour for 75 students apiece. So put it in the mailbox. Uh, with all the carryings on about one or two points, after I've given 15 questions and each one broken down to three or four parts, and all the ex uh, emotion that's involved, whether it's one or two points off, uh, I've just about come to the conclusion that we'll give the standard exam of five questions worth 20 points apiece on discussion, and then we can just mark them any way we see fit. Um, that's the usual rule, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. So. Uh, if we're going to have all this carrying on about one or two points here and one point there, and I've, I've had two or three of you get emotionally upset over one point. Uh, we might just give five questions for 20 points apiece, and then we can just mark them minus five, minus 10, or minus 15. That, that's what's usually done. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, I never look at names. I really don't. That's why some of you I come in later and I say, well, my gosh, I didn't know what you're doing, but I don't look exam at names when I grade, and uh, we certainly don't, we make a real point of not looking at names when we uh, try to draw the breaking points. So some of you who wanted to come in and argue about questions on your blue book, put them in my mailbox, and uh, most of the people here got two points plus plus three, nothing, three, two, and nothing. So that gives you a batting average. Okay, now, uh, we're changing the subject entirely, as Dr. Cleaver pointed out. Um, the rest of today, 10 minutes, we're going to talk about phylloxera. You've heard about it ever since the course started back in Christmas. And uh, you've got a handout here. Um, and... Uh, 
just very briefly, the one on the front you got here is a chart, and you substitute that chart for the one that's in the textbook. That chart's in the textbook. I've been teaching it for 15 years, and I still can't understand that chart. So uh, this is supposed to be a much better one on phylloxera, and it'll be in the new textbook. Okay, now just to, we're going to go over this whole matter of phylloxera more or less roughly. Uh, remember that phylloxera, I better leave that there when we need it. Remember that phylloxera is native to the United States. No, that's all right. They can read that, can't they? <laughs> uh, so we have phylloxera, which is ditty. This is the scientific name, but for what you need to know in this class, of course, it's just phylloxera. And... Uh, so say it's native to the United States, east of the Rocky Mountains, and it's one of the odd insects, or bugs, or pests, whatever you want to call it, of the world in that it seems to be specific for grapes. So it attacks the roots and the leaves of both cultivated and wild vines. And I'll show you some slides in a moment after we get through going over the preliminaries here. I said... Um, it was introduced into France and all that business of taking uh, wild vines from Vineland, from the United States to, to uh, Europe in the late 1800s. And uh, the best way I have of remembering this, it happened about the time of the Civil War because I am to be in the South and the Civil War is pretty, pretty much there. So it's about 1863 when they first, the first recorded evidence of the, of the phylloxera being present in France. But it probably been there for at least five or ten years before they discovered it. And of course, you know it's the most terrible catastrophe outside the potato blight business in Ireland that ever happened to Europe. In a period of about 20 years, from about 1865 to about 1885 or 1900, it wiped out about, well, what was then known, it wiped out about three-fourths of the grapes of the world. And it really caused all sorts of poverty and, and et cetera, and problems in Europe, especially France, Italy, and Spain, until they got around to what I told you in 116A. They got really busy on breeding for rootstocks. Remember I told you that the early breeding work was not done to improve varieties. It was done to try to get a rootstock which would be resistant to phylloxera. So this was the origin of you know, every cloud has a silver lining. We wouldn't have had a lot of great breeding work done if they hadn't had phylloxera introduced to Europe. Okay, then it came, they're not quite sure whether it came to California from uh, the eastern U.S. or via France. The general feeling is that it came from France. In other words, it didn't get here by the uh, 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 wagon trains from the east he got here by boat from France, supposedly, because they found it first in California about up near Sonoma, about 1873, which is about 10 years after it appeared, after they identified it in France. And of course then it spread over the northern coast counties and uh, wiped out a lot of vineyards here in the north coast county. If any of you read Leon Adams' book, you can read where that's probably the biggest single cause why the grape industry really went on the downhill skids in Sonoma area because of the phylloxera. Uh, and now in California, of course, it's quite uh, prevalent and common in all the North Coast area. Uh, in the uh, Livermore area, south of the bay, and in all except that we, at the moment we don't seem to have it in Salinas Valley but it's present in Fresno and Tulare counties. Uh, have quite large areas of infestation. Now, a couple of reasons why that is true. The phylloxera 
likes heavy soil. But particularly, it likes heavy soil that cracks. Because these little bugs, which are really a type of aphid, they are, I'll show you some pictures in a moment, but all of you have seen aphids on roses, green little aphids on roses, and it's a type of aphid, which is orange, brown in color, but it's on roots only or on roots only of grapes and on the, on the leaves of grapes. And it, it is big enough then that it cannot move as nematodes do uh, well through sandy soil and irrigation. It has to have space enough to crawl. So it likes heavy soil that cracks. And you've got some of this type of soil in Fresno and Tulare counties in the Central Valley. But uh, there's a little background to that too. Why do we have so much, so much phylloxera in Fresno and Tulare County? How'd it get there? Well, one of the things we're going to talk to you about a little bit later is um, uh, Pierce's disease, which we used to call a virus, but don't now, but we'll get to that later. And Pierce's disease happened to hit at Fresno and Tulare County extremely hard on a couple of different occasions. Those uh, bugs, which are the uh, vectors for Pierce disease grow exceedingly well on the wild plants and so forth in the low foothills and they moved into that area and caused terrific wiping out of vines in the 30s especially and then the people wanted vines to replace them so they came up to uh, Napa Valley where there were nurseries and picked up uh, uh, plants and rootstocks and rootings and took them down there and put them in that heavy soil with phylloxera on them and did a nice job of inoculation. So that's the background on that. Okay, so uh, the entire North Coast region, Fresno and Tulare counties, where we have really heavy soils and wherever grapes have been grown for some time, even in a low dye area, uh, phylloxera moving in because of the uh, heavy uh, little medium soils that we have in that area. All Pure vinifera varieties are extremely susceptible. That's something you need to put down. All pure vinifera varieties are extremely susceptible. And as you go into more and more hybrids of American varieties, you get more and more uh, tolerance, not resistance, but more and more tolerance to the insect. Well, the time's up, but I might do all this talking without being able to see a picture of one. So let's take a couple of quick looks at them. We'll show this again next time. But let's take a couple of pictures quick look at what it looks like. This is phylloxera. Whoops. You got them up. That's the last slide, not the first. But while you got it on here, uh, I was going to use this as a kicker. But uh, this is not uh, phylloxera because the bumps are on top of the leaf. This is Eranos mite, E-R-I-N-O-S-E, -E, Eranos mite, that makes these felty patches on the bottom of the leaf and causes the leaf to pucker up on the top side. Phylloxera does exactly the opposite. It makes bags that hang down below them, as I always tell people, like pods on an airplane. It, it, makes, it eats from the top, but it makes bulges that swing down below. Okay, now let's see if we can get the rest. Just another slide. And here's what it look, really looks like. You see, you can't tell it here, because, but that's the bottom side of the leaf. And see the pods hanging down? This is a, uh, uh, an American species in which it affects the leaves, and the pods hang down below the leaf. Not on top, but down below. And then inside that pod, uh, the female lays a number of eggs, and they hatch out there. I'll just buy one more slide so that they have some kind of nudity and then we'll quit. And this is a picture of Dr. Winker, that's Dr. Winker's hand in Germany showing these uh